The respiratory system is made up of organs that help us breathe. Respiration is the term used to describe the exchange of oxygen from the environment for carbon dioxide from the body's cells. The process of breathing air into the lungs is called inhalation, and the process of breathing it out is called exhalation. The respiratory system consists of all the organs involved in breathing. These organs all have their own unique functions that enable us to breathe as we do on average 23,000 times a day. The respiratory system includes the nose and nasal cavity, which perform a number of important functions, such as providing us with a sense of smell, warming and moistening the air we breathe in, filtering out irritants such as dust, and assisting us in the development of sound. The throat, also known as the pharynx, is a tube that carries air from the nasal cavity through the voice box, otherwise known as the larynx, down into the windpipe or trachea. The windpipe then splits into two breathing tubes, which carry the air into the lungs. These breathing tubes are called the bronchi, which extend into the bronchioli. The breathing tubes branch out many times throughout the lungs, until they eventually form tiny thin-walled air sacs or alveoli. The respiratory system does two very important things. It brings oxygen into our body, which we need for our cells to live and function properly. And secondly, it allows us to exhale carbon dioxide from our body. Carbon dioxide is the waste gas that is produced as a part of the body's energy-making process. As you watch the inhalation through the nose, throat, voice box, and into the breathing tubes, you will notice the lungs inflating. As we breathe in, muscles are working to inflate the lungs. The diaphragm, a large sheet of muscle which stretches across our chest under the rib cage, does most of the work during inhalation, causing the chest to expand as the lungs fill with air. The air travels down to the end of the breathing tubes where it enters the tiny air sacs. The tiny air sacs are filled with oxygen from the air traveling down from the breathing tubes. Covering each tiny air sac is a whole network of tiny blood vessels called capillaries. Within the air sacs, the oxygen enters the bloodstream through a process called gas exchange. The tiny air sacs have extremely thin walls with a large surface area lined with fluid to enable gases to dissolve. The oxygen particles from the inhaled air pass through the walls of the tiny air sacs and surrounding capillaries and into the red blood cells inside. Oxygen from the alveolus diffuse into the red blood cell inside blood capillary. The function of red blood cell is to transport oxygen. One microliter of blood contains 4 to 6 million of red blood cells, and each red blood cell contains about 250 million hemoglobin molecules. What is hemoglobin? Hemoglobin is a respiratory pigment due to its function to carry oxygen. It is a quaternary protein with globular shape. It consists of four polypeptide subunits with two alpha chains and two beta chains which are held together by hydrogen bond. Each polypeptide chain contains a heme group which is the binding site for an oxygen molecule. Therefore, one hemoglobin molecule binds up to four oxygen molecules. What are the characteristics of hemoglobin as respiratory pigment? Hemoglobin combines with oxygen to form oxyhemoglobin and reversely. At high concentration or high partial pressure of oxygen, such as in lungs, hemoglobin combines with oxygen to form oxyhemoglobin. Hemoglobin combines with oxygen 
to form oxyhemoglobin. But at low concentration of oxygen, such as in respiring tissue, oxyhemoglobin easily dissociates to form hemoglobin and oxygen. Oxyhemoglobin dissociates to form hemoglobin and oxygen is liberated to be used by the cells. The transportation of oxygen in blood from the lungs to respiring tissues is in the form of oxyhemoglobin. At lungs, the partial pressure of oxygen is high, oxygen diffuses into the red blood cells and combine with hemoglobin to form oxyhemoglobin. Then the red blood cell is transported to the whole body. At the cell body, where the partial pressure of oxygen is low, the oxyhemoglobin will dissociate and release the oxygen to the tissue cells. Oxygen is needed by the body cell to undergo process cellular respiration. The process will produce energy in the form of ATP. The process also produces carbon dioxide as waste product. So this carbon dioxide needs to be transported to the lungs and from there it will be exhaled. Carbon dioxide is transported in blood. It is transported from respiring tissues to the lungs in three different ways. About 7% dissolve in blood plasma, about 23% as carbaminohemoglobin, and about 70% as bicarbonate ions. Carbon dioxide from the respiring tissue diffuses into the blood capillary. About 7% of the carbon dioxide dissolve in the blood plasma. Carbon dioxide diffuses into the red blood cell and combine with hemoglobin to form carbaminohemoglobin. So this is about 23%. And carbon dioxide that diffuses into the red blood cell also undergo a series of reactions until finally it will form bicarbonate ion. So, the carbon dioxide that is transported in this form is about 70%. How is the formation of bicarbonate ions? In the red blood cell, carbon dioxide combines with water to form carbonic acid. This reaction is catalyzed by enzyme carbonic anhydrase. The carbonic acid then dissociate into bicarbonate ions and also hydrogen ions. The bicarbonate ion diffuse out into the blood plasma and chloride ion from the blood plasma diffuse into the red blood cell. This is known as chloride shift and its importance is to balance the electrical charge between the blood plasma and the red blood cell. The hydrogen ion combines with the hemoglobin to form hemoglobinic acid. Blood that carry carbon dioxide is transported until it reaches lungs. At lungs, the carbon dioxide from the blood diffuse into the alveolus to be exhaled. These two diagrams show the pickup of carbon dioxide from the tissue cell into the blood and also the release of carbon dioxide from the blood into the alveolus at lungs. The oxygen dissociation curve of hemoglobin shows the relative amounts of oxygen bound to hemoglobin that exposed to solution with different partial pressure of oxygen. Y-axis represents the percentage of oxygen saturation of hemoglobin and X-axis represents the partial pressure of oxygen. The curve shows that the higher the partial pressure of oxygen, the higher the percentage of hemoglobin saturated with oxygen. When the partial pressure of oxygen is high, such as in lungs capillaries, 
the hemoglobin has a higher affinity to bind to oxygen to form oxyhemoglobin. Partial pressure of oxygen at lungs is 100 mmHg and the percentage of hemoglobin saturated with oxygen is almost 100%. But when partial pressure of oxygen is low, such as in respiring tissue, the oxyhemoglobin easily dissociates and oxygen is liberated to the respiring tissues. Partial pressure of oxygen at tissues at rest is 40 mmHg and the percentage of hemoglobin saturated with oxygen is about 70% from 100% to about 70%. So this is the amount of oxygen unloaded by the hemoglobin to the tissues. Other than hemoglobin, myoglobin is also one of the respiratory pigment. It is composed of a single polypeptide chain with an iron atom in hem group that bind to one oxygen molecule. It has a higher affinity for oxygen than hemoglobin. The function of myoglobin is to store oxygen in the muscle. Myoglobin only will release oxygen that bind to it if the oxygen supply of the hemoglobin in muscle cells has been exhausted such as during vigorous exercise. In comparison, the oxygen dissociation curve of myoglobin is displaced to the left of the oxygen dissociation curve of hemoglobin. Its affinity towards oxygen is higher. For example, when the partial pressure of oxygen is 40 mmHg, the percentage of hemoglobin saturated with oxygen is about 70%. But for myoglobin, it is more than 90%. The shape of the oxygen dissociation curve for myoglobin is hyperbolic. What is Bohr effect? It is the effect of pH or concentration of carbon dioxide on the affinity of hemoglobin towards oxygen. The normal pH of the blood is 7.4. A decrease in pH, for example, from pH 7.4 to pH 7.2, shifts the curve to the right. The normal blood pH is 7.4, but during exercises, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide increases. The concentration of hydrogen ion also increases. This decreases the pH from 7.4 to 7.2. The effect is hemoglobin has a low affinity for oxygen. For example, when the partial pressure of oxygen is 40 mmHg, at pH 7.4, the percentage of hemoglobin saturated with oxygen is about 70%. But at pH 7.2, it is only 60%. So the increase in carbon dioxide pressure will shift the oxygen dissociation curve to the right. This effect is known as bow shift. There are two types of chemoreceptor. The first is central chemoreceptor, which is located in medulla oblongata. The second is peripheral chemoreceptor, which is located in iota, namely aortic bodies, and located in the carotid artery at neck, namely carotid bodies. Properties of chemoreceptors Chemoreceptors are sensory receptor neurons that are responsive to chemical change. This is the aortic bodies that are located at iota and carotid bodies 
that located at carotid arteries. The chemoreceptors are sensitive to decrease in pH, increase in concentration of hydrogen ions, and increase of carbon dioxide partial pressure, and also low partial pressure of oxygen. The role of chemoreceptors in controlling the rate of breathing is to transmit nerve impulse to respiratory center to increase alveolar ventilation. Chemoreceptors detect the decrease in pH or increase in the concentration of hydrogen ions or increase in the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in blood and transmit impulse to the respiratory center. Let's look at the breathing controlling mechanism by respiratory center that lead to inspiration or inhalation. When carbon dioxide levels in tissue increase, this lowers the blood pH. Chemoreceptors in carotid artery and iota detect the decrease in blood pH. Then the chemoreceptors discharge the nerve impulse to the inspiratory center via our feather neuron. Then the inspiratory center transmit nerve impulse to diaphragm and outer intercostal muscle via phrenic nerve and intercostal nerve. Both diaphragm and outer intercostal muscle contract. In lung, the volume increase and the pressure decrease. So, inspiration occur. At wall of bronchus and bronchioles, they are pulmonary stretch receptor. During inhalation, when air enter the bronchus, bronchus expand. The pulmonary stretch receptor detect the stretching of the lung tissue and send impulse through vagus nerve to expiratory center and causing the inhibition of inspiratory center. This cause the diaphragm and outer intercostal muscle to relax. In lung, the volume decrease and the pressure increase. So, expiration occurs. Mama, take this picture for me. I can't use it anymore. It's getting dark. Stomata are tiny openings or pores in plant tissue that allow for gas exchange. Stomata are typically found in plant leaves but can also be found in some stems. Specialized cells known as gut cells surround stomata and function to open and close stomatal pores. The functions of stomata are allow exchange of gases of the leaves, allow transpiration to occur, allowing water vapor to escape from stomata, leaf cooling mechanism, and regulate water loss in leaf. The gut cells which regulate the opening and closing of the stomata are living cells with protoplast, nucleus, chloroplast, and subvacuole. According to the starch sugar hypothesis, the opening and closing of stomata is due to changes in turgidity of gut cells which is associated with the conversion of starch to sugar during daytime when pH is high or conversion of sugar to starch in gut cell when pH is low. When gut cells are turgid, the stomach is open and when gut cells are flaccid, the stomach is closed. During daytime, photosynthesis occurs in chloroplast of gut cell. The process produces sugar, which is sucrose. Photosynthesis uses carbon dioxide, causing the pH in gut cell increase. This condition stimulates the breakdown of starch into maltose, catalyzed by enzyme amylase. 
the sugars which are maltose and sucrose both are soluble in water causing the water potential of the gut cells decrease so water from neighboring cells diffuse into gut cells by osmosis and gut cells become turgy then stomata is open but during night time the concentration of carbon dioxide increase this is because no photosynthesis occur at night and also process respiration release carbon dioxide so the ph of the gut cells decrease the low ph stimulate the conversion of sugar into starch starch is insoluble in water causing water potential of the gut cells increase water leaves the gut cells by osmosis the gut cells become flaccid and stomata is closed